guess this is the one that works, right? It works. <laughs> Thanks for testing. So, as mentioned, I work for Stratasys out of our European office. My job is basically to go around Europe and explain to people what 3D printing is, or additive manufacturing, the fancy word we like to use for 3D printing, and how they can get more out of it. So the first part is pretty easy. We go into new customers, people who just heard about the technology, and we explain to them that the technology is no longer run off unicorn tiers. We now have to use engineering. We ran out of those years ago. So now we use gantries, we use material science to create the parts that we need. The second part of it is going to people that already know about 3D printing and convincing them and explaining to them how they can get more from the technology. That part is much more complicated. I think mostly because we're dealing with engineers there. I'm an engineer, so I'm allowed to say that, right? So the reason it's more complicated is that engineers do a very good job of being consistent in making parts that work. So we're trying to convince them to use a little bit more creativity in what they're doing to do something new and solve challenges in a new way. So basically how this works is, for me, when I went to engineering school, I actually started off in marketing, so I was very happy to be a creative person there. When I stepped into engineering school, some of the first things I went to were math classes. So there, there's a right way and a wrong way to do everything. I tried most of the wrong ways, and in the end figured out the right way. Then you move on to the different sciences, and the same thing. There's a right way and a wrong way. So by the time the engineers are going through school, they get very good at knowing what the right way is to do things. So it's the right way from books, the right way we've done things for a long time. After school, I went off into my first job, which was, inject was designing injection molds. So one of the first days on the job, my boss came to me with a part, and he said, we need a mold for this part. So I said, hey, I'm a pretty smart guy. I almost passed, passed math class on the first try, so I bet I could do that. So I went on to design this mold. In the end, I thought, hey, that looks pretty good. It looks a lot like the other molds I've seen. And he came to me, and I guess he was a lot more polite than I am, but what I understood from what he said is, you did a terrible job. <laughs> so I'm sure those weren't the words he used, but that's what I remembered. And it's my story, so I get to tell it however I want, right? So I went back, and we sat together, and he explained to me the rules of injection molding. He explained to me how to design it. You have to be able to cut the tool. The plastic has to flow a certain way. And he explained to me how it works. So over the weeks, months, and years that I worked there, I got very good at following those rules to design parts. So a part would come in. I would follow the rules. I would design a mold, and the mold would work eventually. It took about four years to get that right on the first try, but eventually I got there. So basically, at that point, I was introduced to 3D printing. So now I had all of the rules that I needed for injection molding. I understood how to design the tools and how the process works. Then there's this new tool. What do I do with a new tool? And that's, I think, where we are with engineers today. So kind of the inspiration for this is I've been thinking a lot about creativity. So back in February, I was back home, sitting outside. My home is Minnesota. Has anybody ever been to Minnesota? Have you ever been there in February? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, man. Yeah. So it's really cold, typically. Normally, it's, I mean, it can get down to minus 30, minus 40 C. That's a pretty typical February. This year, for some reason, it was very warm. It was some, around 20 C this day. So I was sitting outside with my dad, watching the clouds, pretty nice clouds going by. Of course, it's windy, so they're going pretty quickly. After about half an hour sitting there, he said to me, he said, you know, Amos, you have to be really careful. Otherwise, pretty soon, they're all just going to start to look like clouds. And for whatever reason, I've thought about that almost every day since February. I don't know why. But then I started to think of how does this actually affect my life? Because when I was young, I could look at the clouds and imagine anything. There's a dragon. There's a castle. Anything going by. And as I get older, they do kind of just start to look like clouds. And I think that a lot of that was from engineering school. I think that the creativity that you have as a child, it's very easy to lose that. And that's one of the big things that's a hurdle for our industry. Uh, I guess an example of where we stand today, we have a fairly good understanding of 3D printing. But the story I like to use is basically looking at a tram driver. So I know this is going off the rails a little bit. but So we look at the tram driver. So the first day of his job, he gets to work, and his boss is on the tram with him. 
they go driving down the tracks and he picks a few people up at the first stop. And then he goes to the next stop and pretty soon he sees a group of people off to the side and he says, hey, we should go get those people. And his boss says, no, we're on the number two track. We have to keep on this track. So you go to the next stop, pick a few more people up, and he does his route. And day by day, week by week, year by year, pretty soon he doesn't look at those crowds of people on the other sides. He's only looking at that track that he's on to get the mission done that he's set out to do, to follow the number two all the way through the city, through the train station to the airport. One day his boss says, you know, I'm going to invest in this new technology. I heard it's the future of transportation. It's called a bus. So he buys a bus. And he says, I need to put my best man on this job. So he gets the guy who's been driving this tram for 20 years. He's always made money for the company driving the tram. And he says, you're now in charge of driving the bus. Do whatever you want with it. Just make sure you make me money. So the new bus driver gets in the bus. And he starts to drive. And he says, oh, man, where should I go today? I know. There's always been people along this track. So he goes the same route. And he follows that same track all the way through town. And he picks up people. In fact, his bus is a little bit more efficient than his train was. It's a magical bus. So he picks up some people, and he makes the company money. He actually makes the company more money than he did before. Not a lot more, but it's more. So his boss is happy. His boss made a great investment with the new, techno the new technology. And I believe that that's where we sit with 3D printing today, is that it's a new technology, and people are finding a way to do the same things they did before, for the most part, in a little bit more effic effective way. Sometimes it's not as effective, and now it's not a good technology for them. But they're looking at the same problems and the same solutions than they have been before. So if we look at the other side of this, you know, we can forget about bus and tram drivers for a little bit. And before people become engineers, you know, can they do a better job of looking at new technologies? So I had the opportunity a few years ago to get involved with FIRST Robotics in the US. I know we have a few people from the US here. Has anybody had anything to do with that organization? So if not, you should all just move to the US and get involved with it. It's a STEM program, basically for people up to about 18 years old, where groups come together in high schools and they give them a challenge. So the challenge that I was involved with is that people had to get a Frisbee and throw it through a goal. It's pretty easy, except when you have to program the robot to do it. In many cases, the robot has to aim automatically. So it's programming vision systems, designing robots. And these are children with absolutely no engineering experience. So my first day there, I sat with a group. And all the kids were talking about ideas. And one of the other mentors, yeah, I guess I can say it, he's much smarter than I am. So one of the other mentors was sitting there. And he told me, he said, you know, don't get in the way of what they're doing. Just let them make the choice. And then if they have a question, answer their question. Don't tell them what to do. So, all right, seems like my job just got a little bit easier. So it got to the point where they're ready to design this robot and actually build it. And they said, OK, we want to design it on a computer. I said, oh, perfect. I've been designing injection molds for quite a while. I know how to do that. So I said, all right, who in this room knows how to do CAD? So the computer designed. And nobody raised their hand. So now my job's getting a little more difficult. And I said, who here wants to learn how to do CAD? And two kids raised their hand. I think they're about 15, 16 years old. So we walked over to the computer lab. The other mentor told me again, he said, don't tell them what to do, just answer their questions. So we got into the computer lab. The kids started the software up, and pretty soon the kids said, OK, well, I want to make a tube. How do I make a tube? So I said, well, it's that button. All right, well, I want to cut a hole through the tube. How do I cut a hole through the tube? I said, well, it's this button over here. And that's kind of how the lessons went that night. So I'm a very good teacher. It only took a couple hours to get through it. So I came back the next week, and they designed this entire robot. I'm sure that it was only because of my incredible teaching skills of showing them where the buttons were. Maybe it had a little more to do with creativity and being willing to fail. But they designed the whole robot. So months went on, and those kids competed in their competition and you know, finished somewhere in the middle of the pack. It was, it was good. It was a bunch of 15-year-old kids made a robot do exactly what they set out to do. An incredible thing. And it's schools all across the US that do this. So a few months later, I got an email from one of these kids. I'm working at Stratus at the time. I have, I don't know, something like 20 industrial 3D printers there that I can use. So he emailed me and he said, hey, I have a special project. I need three parts printed for it. Can you do it for me? So I said, yeah, I can probably do that. Just send them over. So he sent them over. They're really strange looking parts. And so I said, what are these for? He said, well, it's, a, it's another competition we're doing. It's a windmill. 
said, all right, how'd you design them? Because I couldn't figure it out. And he started explaining it to me, and that's when I realized I was in real trouble because the 16-year-old's explanation was far too complicated for me to understand. <laughs> so I said, okay, good, uh, yeah, I'll build the files for you. So a couple months went by, it was July. In the US, we like to have company picnics. So I walked into the company picnic, we all have name tags. I picked up the name tag and I stuck it on my shirt, I was with some of the other engineers. And I noticed on the back of the little name tag holder, there was a note. It said, call me, Lisa. I thought, hey, I'm doing pretty good. <laughs> And then I asked the receptionist, I said, Who, who's Lisa? She said, oh, that's Scott's wife. So Scott is the founder of our company. And all of a sudden, I went from feeling like I'm doing pretty good to, oh, I'm in a lot of trouble. <laughs> so a couple days went by. I was sure I was going to lose my job somehow, but I called her anyway. She said, we need to see you downtown. You know, show up for the bus on Wednesday morning. So Wednesday morning, I got on this bus, and I headed downtown with a couple other engineers. We got there, I walked into a room, it was from an organization that runs a project called Kid Wind. And they said, we have a real problem. There's a problem with one of the student teams. And I said, oh, okay, I'm sure I had nothing to do with it. And they said, does anybody know who these kids are? These kids look pretty familiar to me. Maybe they're the ones that I built these weird looking parts for. So I slowly raised my hand and I said, yeah. They said, all right, how'd you design that part for them? Because they won our competition. I said, well, I didn't. I said, well, we know you did because there's no way that 16-year-old kids did that. I told them that there's no way that I can do that. I have no idea how they designed that part. <laughs> Once I convinced them that I was telling the truth, I don't think it was so hard, then the conversation changed. It went from, you know, why did you help these kids do this when you shouldn't have to how did you empower them to do that? And really all I did was give them the tools to do their job, their job, right? So I let these kids be creative and try the things that they wanted to try. And I think that that's something that we're really missing in engineering as a whole, is that we don't have people just giving the tools and saying, try it. So when we look at the rest of the world, I'm not saying that we all have to be children to do a good job at whether it's additive manufacturing or the other industries that we work in. I just believe that we have to have a little bit more creativity. We need to be able to find that inner child and somehow bring that back to the surface. And that is if we want to go and take the challenges that we're solving today with traditional means and solve them with a new technology the same way, we don't have to be so creative. But if we want to really change the world, if we want to take that bus away from the same track, maybe now we're going from the university to the bars. I heard a lot of people like to do that. I'm sure I was not one of them. But maybe it's a new business model. There's a lot of opportunities out there that I believe have not been touched at all in additive manufacturing. There's a few companies doing it. But I think with a little bit of creativity, we can all do a lot better job at it. So I believe that if we look a few years from now, as kids like these come into the workforce that have a much more open mind to different technologies, we'll see, we'll see things escalate much more quickly. We'll see the process of additive manufacturing be adopted more widely, and we'll see much more innovative solutions, such as the stuff in space. I mean, this is something that I work in this industry, and I haven't thought of this. So that's, you know, we need new creative minds in this industry and many others. So, my ask for you is today, when you go back outside, we are in London, so I guarantee it will be cloudy. <laughs> Look up into the sky. When you see those clouds, just remember that if you're not careful, pretty soon they're all just going to start to look like clouds. Thank you.